exposed about four or five miles north of the junction of Highway 2 on the corner there. And it was right where the, the pipeline crossed Blacktail Creek. It did impact the creek itself as well as the Little Muddy River, which flows down towards Willisville. Okay, so here's my, my best visual representation. The spill occurred on some of midstream's Marlin gathering system. You can see the extent of this system. The system uh, collects both oil and salt water, although the release was only on the salt water line. But the gathering system collects uh, the salt water from south of the point of release there and moves everything up north and northeast to the salt water disposal wells. As far as the salt water system goes, it is a closed system with no other connections in or out other than uh, the wells contributing. Construction on the Marmon system started in 2013. Uh, some of the system became operational in the early summer of 2014. The uh, release occurred in August of 2014 and was reported in January of 2015. And we'll talk about why that is. All right, so what happened? What caused the spill? There's a number of failures that led to this spill or release. First off, there's problems with the installation of the pipe. And that is a picture of the actual pipe and the release point uh, there. Secondly, there are problems with how the pipe was tested following installation. There was problems with the leak protection system, and there was a, definitely a problem with the reporting of the spill. Here's a close-up of the point of release on the pipe. I'll come back to that in a second. So the pipe is a polyethylene, polyethylene inner core, which is wrapped in a fiberglass, which is then covered in a protective layer. So the polyethylene contains the fluid, the fiberglass provides structural integrity to allow higher pressure than a regular polyethylene pipe would. Some of the requirements of this pipeline include in the manufacturer's uh, installation instructions. The first one to cover has to be no large rocks, no frozen chunks, um, cover gently. And they require a manufactured representative on site during installation. Um, while I can't vouch for the first item, too, there was not a manufactured representative on site during installation. And so it's questionable whether those other conditions were met as well. Now you can see what happened here is those rocks or lumps or chunks, anything that impacts that pipe can damage that fiberglass uh, layer. Once that happens, the inner pipe will still be intact. In fact, the outer covering could be intact as well, which is the case here. You can see that it blew open once that was released. That tells me that that outer coating was still intact when the, when the pipe uh, let go. And so if you just have that polyethylene pipe, it won't leak right away. What happens is that polyethylene will expand and stretch with the change of the pressure because it doesn't have that fiberglass backing to back it up. And then eventually it'll yield, and that's when the pipe lets go. One of the other failures was with the testing of the pipe. Again, the manufacturer has some specific requirements for how the pipe needs to be tested. They, they I call recommendation, but actually requirements under their um, um, manufacturer's uh, warranty is that it be tested with water at 1.2 to 1.5 times the rated pipe pressure, not the maximum allowable operating pressure. In this case, the pipe was only tested to a 750 psi, and it should have been 900. 1125 psi, and it was tested with uh, nitrogen gas to that lower pressure and not to the higher pressure. And even at that lower pressure, they had multiple pipe failures during that testing process, but uh, they would fix uh, individual points of release without recognizing that there was potentially a water problem. Second failure was the leak detection system. So originally, as this uh, gathering system was designed, there was a line balancing system, whether it be a fairly regular line balancing system design. Line balancing system uh, records the amount of fluid into the line and out of the line on an ongoing basis, on an almost continuous basis. The problem was while the inlet meters were installed at each well feeding into the pipeline, there was no outlet meter installed. Inlet meters had both flow and pressure, but there was nothing on the outlet side to allow for that line balancing. At least until Christmas Eve, and we'll talk about that. The EMP company, the company that owned both the production wells and the disposal wells, noted that there were discrepancies because they do. They were reporting how much fluid they were sending into the pipeline system. They also could see at the injection wells. While that also included some truck volumes coming into the injection wells, 
they could see there was a, a discrepancy there and they noted that and, and formed the pipeline company in November. In addition to the leak detection system, there's also aerial and ground inspections of the pipeline that were conducted um, one per month during the times that they would have detected the leak. And the question is, would they have detected the leak? Well, the top picture there is an aerial photo taken on October 2015. And you can see, I think pretty clearly, the point of release, the flow path of oil on the surface, and the entry into Blacktail Creek. One of the problems was the folks that were looking at the pipeline from the air and the ground weren't actually informed that there was any leak suspected. Secondly, there was no evidence that the people on the ground left the vehicle to do any on the ground inspection. They drove by, they did not walk the line. And so that went undetected yet. There was a number of warning signs. There should have been indicators that there was a problem in the pipeline system. First off, on the day of the release on 817, the pressure sensor on the well nearest to the point of release recorded a pressure drop, drop from 500 PSI to less than 100 PSI at the same pumping rate. That should have been an indicator here. Pumping the same volume through the same pipe at a much lower pressure, something would change. Second is that, again, the EMP company noted the volume discrepancy starting in October at 3,700 pounds per day from what was they were pumping into the pipe to what was arriving at their disposal pile. That increased from October through December, but go up to 4,900 barrels per day. The data on Christmas Eve, the pipeline company finally installed an outlet meter at the disposal well, allowing them to conduct proper line balancing. Or they didn't. They didn't look at that data from that meter until January 1st of 2015. And by January 6th, the EP company again reported to the pipeline company this discrepancy that had grown to 5,700 barrels per day by that. Finally, on January 6th, somebody walked the line and they discovered the point of release. It was reported the next day to North Dakota and our still response uh, reporting system as a part of the National Response Center. Same day, both reports indicated unknown quantity. Report to the NRC indicated no sheen, uh, no supplement creek. Those reports were updated to North Dakota on the 13th, on um, the NRC on the 21st around 70,000 barrels. However, the actual release volume was greater than 700,000 barrels. The estimates of the volume and the duration of the leak going back to August were known and discussed by Summit on the 6th of January, and that was not disclosed to anybody. And I heard questions of why, when well, we get the penalty, but why is the penalty so great? That is really what triggered that. that at that point, this became a criminal matter. And that's why I couldn't even talk about any of this information up somehow when the whole matter has been basically settled um, because of that. And so it was the relying on the spill report, the failure, failure to disclose that relevant information as part of the spill reporting that triggered criminal investigation. Ultimately, in the end, the settlement was reached uh, with some midstream and included $15 million in criminal penalties, primarily for the um, lack of uh, reporting of relevant information. 20 million in civil penalties, which was split between EPA, where again, this is discharged to waters of the US uh, because the impacts did reach all the way to the Missouri River, um, and also violations of the North Dakota DEQ's rules and the North Dakota Industrial Commission rules. Also included one and a quarter million for damage restoration uh, for natural resource damages which is to make up for the damage to the ecosystem in that time frame between when the leak occurred and when the remediation will be completed. And the, the response and reclamation has so far cost over $50 million. This is, was a sizable spill, um, and that's what prompted the sizable settlement that was um, included here. So shortly, a take-home message for, uh, and I know most of you are in the environmental field, you're probably not the operations folks, Please take this message back to operations folks because if this happens, it'll make your life hell. Is that you got to pay attention to your leak detection. On all of these, it was not a technology, on this, it was not a technology failure, it was a human failure where people did not follow either recommended practices or did not believe what the data was telling them. So, um, with that, I will turn it over to Harold. Now, Harold uh, has been 
in charge of this release and the remediation and restoration since about July of 2015. Um, and he has been um, one of the, the bright spots of this release is that I get to work with Harold and he's done a lot of innovative stuff. With it. So as Carl mentioned, my name is Harold Rhodes. Uh, I've worked with Summit directly, almost uh, exclusively for several years on Summit's uh, remediation activities. Uh, at Blacktail, I think that our response has evolved uh, over the last several years. And as Carl mentioned, I, I think that there are uh, different or definitely ways that, that things are done differently now and, and lessons that, that have been uh, taken to heart, not only from an operation standpoint uh, and ensuring that something like this never occurs again, but also uh, more specifically, uh, how our actual remediation efforts have, have evolved over the last several years. One of the focus, focuses that, that I have and, and our group that we work with out in the field each day is the identification of, of what tools and resources we have available to us. Some of the discussions that we had earlier this morning regarding uh, publicly available resources whether that be NRCS, uh, obviously satellite imagery is extraordinarily helpful, but there's a wealth of knowledge that's out there and available at your fingertips that actually help to guide and ensure that your response, wherever it may be, can not only be site specific, but also be effective. I think the available tools, one of the things that we've come to rely upon a tremendous amount is the available field screening methods and parameters, uh, whether that be simple hatch chloride titration strips uh, to be able to, to sample for the presence of chlorides quickly in the field is extraordinarily helpful. Uh, we use a YSI Quattro uh, water quality sampling, um, various other you know, meters and tools that actually provide a immediate uh, field screening indication. Obviously, they're not analytical in quality, but they do get us, you know, in the ballpark, you know, where we need to be to be able to make that immediate decision. In addition to that, um, we have emphasized throughout the project the value and critical nature of analytical data. We have, uh, we call it the flat file, but we have a data file that has 340,000 individual sample lines. That doesn't include trip blanks, uh, lab duplicates, anything. But literally we've, we've got 380,000 samples. In One of the last things that I think we've really begun to realize over the last couple of years is that having the right resources and having the right tools is absolutely essential, but without the right people and the right group that you're working with, then, then really it, it it, it's hard to be successful. I think that that is probably one of our biggest takeaways from Blacktail is that we really have a diverse group of people that have helped us, not only with the ongoing response at Blacktail and how we approach the various remediation activities, but also how that group or that team has, has been able to respond in the event that an incident were to occur somewhere else. And we've had several opportunities, unfortunately, uh, to have that. When we look at that, we're looking at Blacktail now a site-specific nature to it. I think that because the remediation activities at Blacktail did extend or, or are ongoing and have extended for such a long period that it's, it's allowed us the opportunity to gather a wealth of information, a wealth of data. And that data is actually allowing us to create site-specific approaches or has given us the opportunity over time to gain a site-specific understanding of, of how we can approach it. And that goes down to the micro level, whether that be a, uh, ecosystem specific, uh, the historical uses, how we actually interact, interact with, with various landowners, the regulators, uh, it could be the Army Corps of Engineers, everybody that, 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 unique nature of where that spill occurred is, is absolutely 
absolutely critical. Future uses, public health, wildlife, livestock, all of those play into a, a matrix from where <coughs> we can kind of create, develop a plan that can be executed, but also a plan that we can communicate to the people that we're literally working with and for. When we look at some of those initial site-specific variables, as we approach a site or as we're coming up, obviously we've already had the opportunity to, to gather what available public resources, whether that be the, the internet or some historical knowledge, but we're also actually looking at the topography. How far is this going to have moved? What are some of the, the unique characteristics of that specific soil type that would potentially uh, favor or result in an overland flow or depending on where the leak occurred, are we looking at, at a specific soil type and the permeability or the hydraulic conductivity of those subsoils could actually result in it actually moving uh, below grade. Topography, soil type, and the environmental receptors. When we look at that also, it's primarily surface water and what the uses are, you know, at that moment and that time. Surface water is one of our our primary focus is now, uh, I think our, our ultimate objective from a response perspective is that we don't believe there should ever be an instance where surface water is impacted. Again. When we look at those surface receptors and how they, they potentially are impacted, then we're looking at that from from the entire scope, from the chronic to acute impacts to various aquatic species. In the instance of blacktail, that initial impact, or at the point where it was reported, that initial impact was catastrophic. I think one of the takeaways we've had at this point is, is how encouraging it is to, to see how resilient nature is if the correct control measures and remediation plans are put in place to where it can actually begin to repair and restore and repopulate itself. But that goes to the macro fish repairing as a whole, how that's, that's all interconnected. Same thing with the surface soils. I think the understanding of what, what specifically in this case, a produced water spill would result in, I think that's understood. I think that as a result of blacktail, we've been able to look at that differently. I think that, that in 2015, on a significant spill, we approached it similar to a, a EMS or an ambulance approach in a car accident, but rather than trying to see what we could actually help, what we could save, who needed assistance, is that historically the the accident investigation took priority and took place first. I think over time now, our response is completely transitioned to where we're looking at what can we actually save. We don't feel that loss of vegetation is a given. That, in fact, we believe the, the opposite. We don't feel that uh, negative, significant, prolonged, beyond our, our actual response phase to, to the environment is, is a given. We feel that we can actively approach that. The subsurface impacts at Blacktail specifically uh, were difficult. The, the spill did uh, occur over an extended period, uh, breached the surface, but because of its proximity to Blacktail Creek and the hydraulically conductive soils right in the area near the creek, that a significant amount of that spill traveled parallel to or in the subsoils that perched shallow aquifer alongside the creek. This was compounded as, to a certain extent by, by the, the gaining and losing nature of, uh, of the ephemeral or intermittent streams that impacts to, to uh, the surface from, from the spill itself uh, and its impact to the groundwater, you know, evaporations as a result of our, our disturbances, uh, evaporation became, became a huge issue. Uh, the actual surface disturbances as a result of our initial response 
were far larger than the actual surface disturbances as a result of the initial spill. I think that's one of the things also that's kind of led us to try and look towards different ways that it could be approached. Soil types uh, there through Blacktail Creek are dominated by the Harriet Stair, which are a alternating clay and sand layers or lenses. Uh, you kind of envision a, a soil column that, that's put together like a lasagna to where you have uh, semi-permeable clay and silty layers interspaced with, with thin lenses of highly permeable uh, sand or even in some cases well-washed uh, rocks and gravel that, that actually would flow at had hydraulic conductivities approaching pipe velocities, that they were super hydraulically conductive. Going back to the delineation and how we focus now on the delineation and gathering that data, that that, that delineation process is not a phase. It's not something that, that we delineate at the beginning and then based upon that, we develop a response or remediation plan that's gonna extend over the entirety of the project. In fact, that delineation is always being updated, always being uh, refocused, and it, it becomes a, a process that we continually gather data, we continually track that, and based upon, based upon that data, that actually drives how we actually approach it. So I think that's, that's another thing as far as the approach wise that we've been able to do at Blackdale is that our day-to-day -day activities are in response to our day-to-day -day, uh, data. I think what we've, we've seen also, this is not only at Blacktail, but, but other recent spills is that our response interactions and how they were, those interactions are with the environment or, or, or the ecology of the site is that it becomes self each each one feeds the other so if we can make an improvement in soil quality we automatically will result it automatically results in an improvement in vegetative health vegetative health improves surface water quality and it continues on if we can improve surface water quality or groundwater quality it'll improve soil quality soil quality improve vegetation, vegetation improves soil health. It just continues moving. So anywhere where we had an opportunity to improve soil health, uh, increase the areas that have been restored or revegetated, uh, increase or enhance water quality in a localized area, we've always looked at those independently and taken advantage of that. So our, our goal isn't, once again, isn't, is it fixed rather that as various opportunities present themselves that we're always looking to, to grab and try and take that. The utilization of available tools and resources, uh, our response tools and how various activities are performed, I think have evolved tremendously over the last several years. Uh, initially, we had uh, several different groups come out with geoprobes and the quality of the data, the information that, that was gleaned from that, that activity was extraordinarily helpful. What, what we thought there was room for improvement for or with is that we need that data continually. We need to be able to update it continually. We need to have access to that. This, this is one of the the systems that we developed. We wanted a tool that could be attached on a skidster or an excavator that would actually perform those functions. Do we need to geoprobe? Then we can geoprobe. If we're doing air sparging or infiltration or recovery, that we wanted some multi-flexible tool or equipment platform that would do every, every one of the various remediation tasks or processes potentially we would do to be able to have that mounted upon something that was going to be so heavy that it was going to result in, in a tremendous uh, surface disturbance. And that's, that's one of the examples. Of that. I think that's, that's it. I think our response initially at Blacktail was purely reactionary. Um, 
nobody had, even at 70,000 barrels, nobody had experienced or responded to something like that. I think over the course of the next 12 to 18 months, for me personally, uh, that 70,000 barrel number uh, was difficult to support with the data because we did have so much in the field. But even at that point then, that what what the scope of it was that we started to focus on, on actually what we could do and actually what we were seeing in the field. I think our response today is a result of that. Uh, number one, that, that we do focus on the receptors and we do focus on that initial delineation. And, and in doing so, it allows us to target uh, those areas where we can have the greatest effect. If that's recovery of surface water, if that's using a, a soils washing process within 48 to 72 hours in an existing wetland, that, that actually is, is how we approach it. I think our response tomorrow is where, where the promise is. I think there is an extraordinary amount of knowledge and understanding that is out there right now that over the next, uh, I believe within the next couple of years, will we'll start coming to bear. And I think there'll be a, a tremendous amount of advancements in, in how we approach uh, remediation, not only in response to a spill or an incident such as blacktail, but how potentially we look at restoration and remediation of reclamation uh, completely unrelated to spills, potentially still within the industry. But I, I think there's a lot of promise on all of